Good morning, Arcade Church. It is good to see you guys. Real quick before we start, I was informed a few minutes ago that actually uh, the Kachuks, uh, Peter and Arena Kachuk, are actually here this morning, and they're actually going to be in the lobby. Uh, for anyone who wants to go talk with them and find out how things are going, they, they're in from Ukraine. Can we give them a hand for one thing? Good night. And... Uh, I'll be honest, today's passage is one of the uh, like, greatest hits of Christianity. It's like the, it's the Bible story that's on the front of the, all the brochures. It's the whole Peter walking on the water and all that good stuff. And like many passages that we find ourselves exceedingly familiar with, it's likely we're missing things because of that familiarity. So what we're going to do, we're going to take our time through that, and then we're going to wrestle through and pray what it is the Spirit wants us to change, adopt, or even repent of in the way we deal with difficulties, trials, and tribulations. Okay? These are the words of God. From Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land beaten by the waves. For the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart. It is I. Don't be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come on the wa- come out to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Let's pray. Spirit, we need you this morning to remove blinders we've had for a long time. Uh, I have no idea what anybody in this room has been through this week. No clue. I do know, however, that nothing has erupted in their lives or mine that is beyond your sovereign care. And I, I don't know, I get a sense this morning that I think we need this. So, would you teach us things we would never know were it not for your spirit? Would you help us make connections we've never made before? Um, Would you grant us a sense of awe that would turn our life from black and white to color? We love you, we thank you, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So, think of the last time in your life where everything was going perfectly fine. And then on a dime, things went sideways really, really fast. Right? You became subject to forces that were outside your control. When something should have been so straightforward became inexplicably difficult, and you were more or less powerless to do anything about it. 
those moments, what are those? Like, what are they? What are they made of? I'm not even asking why at this point. I'm just asking what they are. Because, see, the gospel seem to suggest that there are times when Christ will expose his disciples to sudden crises that echo the kind of rescue God performed for them when he brought them out of Egypt. There are these little partial scenes of God's provision through the wilderness or making it through the Red Sea. And we have these moments in our lives that if you squint just hard enough, you can almost see them have the same outline insofar as they demand the same response from us as they did from ancient Israel. Faith. Trusting obedience. Imperfectly executed, I might add. I think that's what we saw last week, though. Last week, we talked about the feeding of the 5,000, right? And what we saw there was Jesus basically provokes a crisis in which the way he comes through for people matches really close to some miracle God did in the Old Testament. And what he's doing for really his disciples, probably above anybody, is he is associating the miracles of the Exodus with his own identity. Because his whole point is, I am the God of the rescue. It has been me, and it has always been me. And that's hard to tell people, so you have to more or less show them instead. Right? And so that's exactly what we saw. Jesus provokes a crisis when we wind back the clock one week, and what do we see? Jesus says, they need not go away, all these crowds of 5,000 people. He goes to his disciples and says, you give them something to eat. So Christ provokes a crisis, right? that removes their sense of safety and stability and predictability. So they're sort of off balance. At which point, he replaces that sense of safety or off balance-ness with awe of him. And that awe of Jesus, when the passage ended last week, it's still sort of crackling in the air. You know, and because it more or less ended up being crisis averted. So the disciples' life was kind of like this. It turns out, historians inform us that the tangy goodness and incredible value of Olive Garden made its first appearance in the first century. Crazy, I know, right? But no, things, the cycle completed last week. Crisis, removal of safety and certainty, and then a replacement with awe of Christ Jesus. And now we're going to see the cycle start over. in a way that the stakes are a little bit higher. Within the next few hours, this is going to be the disciples' experience, and they don't even know it yet. That's what's wild to read this. It's like, guys, if you only knew what was ahead of you, if you only knew the way Jesus, for your good, was going to push you to the absolute limits of human endurance, faith, and trust, and then he's going to hold you there, For purposes, you might not understand until it happens. Christ, in our passage today, again, provokes a crisis. See it right here. Check this out. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. I don't know if you can tell or not, but there is a huge shift in the energy of the scene there. And it's going to be easier to see if I read this kind of audibly in a way that you'll hear what Matthew wants your attention to draw to. Same passage. See what happens when I read it a different way. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. 
Catch that? So if you were a rabbi, right, you're lecturing to a large group of people, it would typically be the job of your students to handle crowd control once everything winds down. So the rabbi would pronounce a blessing on the hearers and send them on their way, but the sending really happens through the followers and disciples, the guys following him around. And what Jesus has just done, for reasons we don't know yet, is switch jobs. Okay? Something else you need to see here. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat. I'll be honest, the most wooden and kind of literal way to bring that across is immediately he forced them into the boat. Right? A minute ago, they were just counting loaves like, this is crazy, 12 extra baskets, what are you going to do? And then Jesus basically handles them like a secret service agent putting a head of state into an armored limo and just sends them out with all this silent intensity. Because it's now suddenly urgent that they get a head start? Why? Well, there's something he wanted to do. He knew in order to see what was true about him, they had to see themselves apart from the security and safety. They, it's human nature to surround yourself with. And so he removes their sense of safety and security. Oh, and he does it in a big way. Right? Check out the contrast here. This is wild. And after he had dismissed the crowds, Jesus, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Something to point out. Ink's expensive in the ancient world. And Matthew is tripping over himself. For us to know, he was by himself, he was by himself. He just like repeats it. Oh, by the way, did I mention that Jesus was alone? Why? Well, because what's about to happen in the next few minutes, you have to understand Jesus didn't have any help. Okay? But that's, that's the one scene. So Jesus serenely communing with the Father. This is what he's been wanting to do for like, Two chapters by now, and he's finally got a chance to do it. What's the contrast scene? Verse 24. But the boat, by this time, was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Um, depending on which translation you have, your Bible may say many stadia or whatever, this is where it's kind of helpful to look at God, John's gospel. He's a little more precise in uh, what he records in terms of distance. So he says 25 or 30 stadia, 600 feet to a stadium. They're three to four miles out. So three to four miles from shore, beaten by the waves. And uh, <laughs> there's more going on here than it meets the eye. That's fine. But beaten, there's sort of a tame way to bring that about. It literally means tortured. The boat is being tortured by the waves. It's being twisted in ways it shouldn't be twisted. The wind is against it. And in, this is kind of odd. I, this was the one time I've seen, I think, this word ever applied to any, any, any object but not a person. It's used more often than not to talk about the torment someone's going through, either under judgment or un if they're being demonized. And there's something to that, right? It's, there's a reason scholars will uh, look at this text a lot and see kind of a few clues to, that, to, to this idea, that they are encountering cosmic resistance on that sea. And to understand it, we need to back up. Okay? Who here uh, follows Stranger Things on Netflix? <laughs> right. I'll see you at Comic-Con. 
Um, <laughs> most people are like, what's Comic Con? <laughs> Tell them, Jen. Um, so, I had a professor one time comment on this evening in scripture, and he says, what Jesus is doing, it's the equivalent of your trusted mentor making you spend the night in a notoriously haunted funeral home during a tsunami. Here's why. And we, we're going to get there by analogy. In the show Stranger Things, right, there's this premise that in a small town in made up Hawkins, Indiana, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy has a laboratory there, and what they're trying to do is engage in the arms race with the Soviet Union uh, to seek the greatest technical advantage, you know, during the Cold War. And in the course of this laboratory's experiments in this town, they accidentally open up this doorway or portal to an alternate realm. And in the show, they refer to that realm as, quote, the upside down. And the upside down, there's no other word for it. Basically, it's, it's a parallel world and a chaotic underworld, right? Characterized by darkness, rot, and putrefaction, or just awful smells, awful things, right? Everything gets worse really quick there, right? Everything's corrupted and twisted there. And the Upside Down is practically made of death and darkness and devouring and decay. And what's peculiar is the Upside Down in the show Stranger Things ends up bleeding into our world. The corruption that exists there ends up trying to spill over into our kind of reality. Uh, the Upside Down is also characterized by strange monsters. This is called the Mind Flayer. Um, other monsters, the Demogorgons, that kind of thing, right? And the up... And here's the weird part. There's this huge... Oh, like, oh, because this isn't weird. Here, let me really tell you. <laughs> First day on the planet. Um, nerds in, like, Bible land are nuts about the show. Not because it's Christian or something. It's totally not. But the cool thing about Stranger Things, it's the best example of cryptonesia we've probably seen in a long time. Cryptonesia, here's what it means. Accidental plagiarism. So much of what Stranger Things is doing with the upside down and the monsters that live there and the corruption, so tightly resembles the way the scriptures talk about both the sea and the grave. Feel me? And in the world of the scriptures, those are two aspects of a greater alternate realm called the deep. You've probably seen that mentioned in the Psalms at times. David is in the deep and the cords of death ensnare him. Those are tree roots, right? And here's the weird part. Job makes this very clear because it's settled sort of knowledge in the ancient world, right? Look at Job 26. The dead tremble under the waters. Why are the dead under the waters? It's because the grave and the sea, even though they're in the deep, they overlap. Me? The dead tremble under the waters. Sheol, the grave, is naked before God, and Abaddon has no covering. These two are parallel. That's just a basic assumption about how the world and the underworld were constructed, right? And here's the weird part, too. There are numerous instances, this is another reason people geek out over this show, of just these chaos beasts and monsters that kind of live in the deep. Psalm 74 records uh, God slaying a multi-headed, coiling monster called Leviathan. And it depicts his slaying of Leviathan as kind of the backdrop to what's happening in Genesis chapter 1 during creation when God is hovering over what? 
the waters. Feel that? So the deep is characterized by this kind of unruly chaos. And the deep, both the sea and the grave, are home to that, especially after the fall. There are other things lurking down there. Job 18 tells us about the king of terrors. Who's that? I don't know, but he sounds great. Um, Isaiah 14 records in Sheol, or the grave, the, war, the wicked slain warrior kings that greet other corrupt world leaders when they arrive. Um, it was very common to associate the grave and the sea with demonic powers. And this is where so much of the logic of the scriptures starts to make sense. Remember back in Matthew 8 when Jesus healed the guy with the critters um, and cast them into the pigs. Where did the pigs go immediately? The sea. So we're, now we're clicking, right? But there's also the issue of just the terror of the waters themselves. Why? Well, it was second nature for, if you're a first century Israelite, to perceive the chaotic waters of the sea, especially during a storm, as a smaller invasion of the same waters that burst from the deep during Noah's flood. Remember? If you look back in Genesis, it's not just the rain that's flooding the earth. You got it. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. And so when they saw the sea sort of twitching and, you know, just pulsing with 10, 12, 15-foot swells and all of that, what they're seeing is the chaotic waters doing what chaotic waters do, push those boundaries. And so there's this real sense that they could be swallowed up by something. And so the disciples, Jesus has left his disciples in a situation characterized not just physical danger and duress, but spiritual, um, what's the word, dread. And the only thing more, I think, shocking than where he's left them was how long he left them there. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. If you're in the first century, you, this is how you thought of the night. It had four parts, 12 hours. First watch was 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. The disciples are terrorized by waves that want to capsize and destroy the boat for three hours. Maybe he'll come. No. Second watch was 9 p.m. to midnight. They're probably pretty cold by that point. There's no electricity out there. There's no bathrooms. No Jesus. Third watch. Midnight to three. No Jesus. Does this sound familiar or commiserate with any of your experiences? Um, I'm only 37, right? But I think what I'm finding is I find myself surprised, not just at times in his wisdom and love, what he's willing to let happen. I'm surprised how long he'll leave me there. Feel me? Like, I'm looking at people right now. Right now. Hell on earth, hell on earth, hell on earth, hell on earth. I know. And it's still going. Fourth watch. 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. And boy, does he arrive. And you know how he makes his entrance? 
The disciples spot something in the darkness that makes their blood run colder than the soaking wet tunics that are clinging to their skin. And this is where he replaces that sense of safety with awe of him. There's a little bit of terror to get through first. Okay? He came to them walking on the sea. What Matthew does here uh, is it's actually beyond cool. Okay? Moses' story is told like it's a, it's a past account, but what's weird is when they see Jesus and he's walking on the sea, Matthew changes the tense of the verbs to present tense. He's writing like he, when he goes to bed at night and closes his eyes, he's still seeing it. Like, it, it, it's, it's right there. It's a sight you never forget. It has this idea that it's not Jesus just, you know, kind of like shuffling along in a puddle, you know, like we've seen it probably portrayed in shows and movies. If you're thinking eight, ten-foot swells, and Jesus is on top of the swells, it's moving pieces of ground to him. So he's timing it, right? Because it's waves. And so they're watching this figure approach the boat in an environment they have no business being in. And this is not just something that's made up. There's a real reason Israel in the height of their like prosperity during David and Solomon, they never built a navy. You know why? Because we don't mess with the sea. We'll fish it. We're not going to fight on it, right? And it tells you a lot about what they expected to meet there. And that explains why they immediately go here. They were terrified and said, it's a ghost. Whatever was coming toward them is perfectly at home navigating the underworld. That's terrifying. Sometimes, when Jesus intervenes in our experience, things get more scary before they get easier. Think of Think of the guy who's been sober for years and he's starting to slip. And maybe his spouse finds out. It's tempting to think in that moment, oh, this is the judgment of God. No, it's not. God pursues those he loves. It's the thing he's afraid to find in that environment, but it's Jesus. They were petrified, convinced it was, I don't know, a victim of Leviathan coming to finish them off. Until that thing opened its mouth. And what they heard was not the shriek of a demon, but a Galilean accent. Take heart. It is I. Don't be afraid. You know what's really cool? This is both casual and astounding at the same time. It is I. It's like, oh, it's me. You know me? The voice of your rabbi. Yes. But it is I is exactly in the more popular Old Testament translations in Greek they were reading at the time, when God announces who he is from the burning bush. Take heart. I am. Don't be afraid. 
It's terror, terror, terror until God reveals himself. That's not just something I'm making up. God said to Moses, I am who I am. In their translation, in the Greek one, it's literally the same words, ego a me. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So, knowing that, and the fact that in antiquity, nobody walked on the sea except God himself, Job 9, who has hardened himself against him and succeeded? Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea? The disciples find out this evening is not what they thought it was. That's a lot to take in, isn't it? We're just going to come up for air. And we'll get to the Peter thing, but uh, let's do a little gut check now. What shall we do with all of this weirdness? Like, where do we even start to import that into our experience? Um, I have some ideas, but this is something that is going to be best vetted and discerned even in, in community, in the scriptures, in ways that are germane to your experience. But I have some general places where we can start, okay? Or this is where I'm starting. Number one, receive the long night. The fact that he doesn't come to the fourth watch is, um, it's terrifying. And it makes you feel like an exception to the love of God, doesn't it? It's like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, see footnote. Oh, oh, dang it, there I am. It's like I'm the only one this just keeps going for. But that's not true at all. Because the fourth watch is, um, it, it's something people who study Bible for a living call the biblical hour of God's deliverance. Because it's always been at the fourth watch. Always. Matthew, later, after he's crucified and rises from the dead. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn... Right before, the sky is between being black and that inky blue toward the east. Before the dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone. Let me read you some other ones. These aren't on screen. Just let this hit you, right? Exodus 14, and in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw them into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. Then, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand that the water may come back upon the Egyptians. Psalm 46, therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam, God is in the midst of his city. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Isaiah 17, the nations roar like the roaring of many waters, but he will rebuke them. At evening time, behold, terror. Before morning, they are no more. The fact that he's late doesn't mean he doesn't love you. The fact that he's late means you have taken your place with those God whom God has set his love from eternity past, and you will fit right in in the kingdom, man. That's the norm. You're not abandoned. It's shockingly normal. I don't even like the fact that it's normal, but it is. So that's where we are. So don't confuse the delay of God for a lack of concern. Second, recall the awe of Christ's past rescues. You know, like if someone asked me, what does persevering faith in Jesus look like? 
I think what I'd say now is this. It's basically spiritual deja vu. You find yourself in a crisis, but instead of freaking out, you say, I've seen this movie before. Or I've seen movies like it before. And then you begin going, thinking through every time God came through in the clutch. And the difference between crippling, crushing doubt and persevering trust in Jesus is the difference between deja vu, and here's a new one, something called jamais vu. You know what jamais vu is? It's the opposite of deja vu. So in, in jamais, jamais vu, you have something happen to you for like the billionth time, and logically you know this has to be the billionth time, but you have no idea what you experienced every other time. Every time it hits you, it's like the first time. And I think I've spent 15 years probably of my Christian life with jamais vu. Every time something happened, I'm like, well, what the heck is this? Like, this was not on the brochure with, like, you know, the kid and, like, the, the feeding and the... Uh, not this. And I did that a hundred times. And I probably do it now, like, 50 until it starts to click. But this explains why Jesus, in, increasingly in Matthew, is going to tell the disciples, no, remember the fish and the loaves, man, come on. He's trying to get them to see these connections because every rescue and every crisis in some way it's an echo of the big crisis he solved for you. You're meant to run it backwards and you might be saying, well, what happens if like, you know, the boat capsizes or whatever? Then they're home with Jesus and it's, that's over too. But the goal is to see the way God has been faithful and then go, oh, and he's always been faithful. He doesn't know how to drop the ball. He, he literally doesn't know how. So just, I don't know, think about the dominoes of events in your life that brought you to this room. What did you get out of? You had no idea what you were going to do. And how many of those were there? And you know what? If you're struggling with some <clears throat> jamais vu this morning, that's okay. We can get some awe from Jesus from this passage itself. Uh, have you noticed this entire account is not a miracle? It's three. Really? The first miracle of this whole shebang is Jesus saw them from a mountain four miles away in gale force winds. Let that sink in. And the miracle that means the most to you or resonates the most to you will tell me a lot about you, actually. What you've been through and what you're working through. Jesus saw their plight from all that way. And you must realize they left about dusk. They shouldn't have needed. How would he even know that they're on that sea at this point? I don't know. The image, of, the image is just Jesus communing with the Father on the mountain and all of a sudden going, I need to go get him. He knows exactly when it's time. Jesus saw them. And some of you, your fear is Jesus doesn't notice your terror. You think, okay, he's at the right hand of God, he's fine, and uh, suffers no thought of my distress. And if that's you, then rejoice. It's never been so good to be so wrong. Okay? The second miracle is, okay, he saw them. How's he going to get to them? He walks right over the water to them. 
Jesus pursued them. Obstacles in the fullness of time literally be damned. He just went right across the water to them. Right across the chaos that no one else could tame. Right across the forces of the unknown that have us cowering on our heels. And some of you probably fear you are in such a mess, in such dysfunctional chaos that um, even if he has seen you, you're kind of hard to get to. You're just too far to reach. It's too much water. If that's you, then rejoice. Because you're wrong too. The only difference to Jesus of Nazareth between dirt to reach you and water is one's brown, the other's clear. But he walks across it just fine. Like some of you are, oh gosh, some of you are probably struggling with all kinds of like, it's a layer of bitterness and then with jadedness and then it's like another layer of bad news and you're kind of at that point where oh, I don't even want to care but I sort of want to want to care. And you're like, okay, I don't know if Jesus <laughs> can work with that. Watch him. The third miracle is the storm calmed. All of these are crucial to Jesus as the God of rescue. And you're conf- I, you, we are confronted with a Jesus who sees, pursues, and calms. Jesus is human enough to know your plight. And he's God enough to actually reach you and do something about it. Which I think leads us to the third way we respond. Resolve to be in awe, not to be the awe. Let's check in on Peter. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? All right. Unpopular opinion. This is not presented as a model for us to follow. It's sort of natural that we assume that, but I think it says more about our cultural values than it does anything else. There's no comment, there's no good job, Peter, in any of this. And the immediate response is well, gee, at least he got out of the boat. Okay, and why did Jesus tell them to come out on the water? He didn't want him to. I don't know. For the same reason God let them have King Saul and then resolve to use that error of judgment to bring them to a knowledge of their frailty and their need of him. Probably like that. And there's this motif in Matthew. It's kind of nuts. We're in Peter unknowingly at times becomes this accidental mouthpiece for how both the kingdoms of Satan and the kingdoms of man demand the kingdom of God should operate. Doesn't it? A few chapters later, Matthew 16. May it never be, Lord. This will never happen to you. You'll never be crucified. Even this, right? The If it's you, command this. When's the last time we've seen that grammatically? It was in the wilderness when Satan was tempting Jesus. If you're the son of God, command the stones to become bread. 
There is a kind of instinct we have to overcompensate from the knowledge that we are not in control. And it's usually to do stuff like throwing down a fleece or saying, God, if you're really with me on this, then let X happen or bring this about. Sometimes he'll do it, but the crazy thing is here, God even answers Peter's like little test and he passes it. Peter fails the test he gave to Jesus, Right? Come out on the water. If it's really you, tell me to come on the water. Okay. Oh my gosh. Right? And so it's, I think it's more helpful to see what happened to Peter, not as, all right, we got to make sure we're not going to look at the waves, guys, right? Eyes up here, not looking at the waves, looking at Jesus. No, I think this is the human condition. Eventually, our eyes will always go there. And there is such a thing as getting more than we bargained for. When we stop trying to imitate Jesus, but start trying to become him and his authority, Jesus can handle the forces of chaos that erupt in the sea and in your life and mine. We can't. And even when he invites us out, he lets us see This is actually harder than it looks, not for me, but for you. And I don't even think Peter's intentions are all bad. (sighs) Nevertheless, though, Jesus does say, come on out. Why? I think, and the same professor kind of beat this in my head, and I, I think he's right. Jesus lets Peter get into enough trouble to make him cry out. You ever done that for you? <laughs> let you like get into just enough over your head where you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Water looks, looks a little cold, eh, Tarzan? That's his mercy. He took Peter's heart posture back to where it should have been. And not only will he do the same for you, he is doing it. So there's a question, though. We looked at a painting from earlier. How are we painting ourselves in that whole story? This painting was done by Rembrandt in 1633. Um, and it's awesome. I mean, truly awesome. There's something weird about it, though. It's Jesus and the disciples in the boat. Disciples make 12. Jesus makes 13. There's 14 people in that boat, though. Why? Why? Rembrandt Payton painted himself in the boat. It's the artist. He's literally holding onto his hat in the wind. And he's locking eyes with us, isn't he? Fully aware of his predicament. Scared, cold, but situated as close to Jesus as he can get. Mastering the forces of chaos, especially when we try to do it codependently in other people's lives, thinking, oh, I can fix this person. No, you can't. You can't. Rembrandt knew where his power ended and God's began. He's not depicting himself as striving for godlike mastery over the forces of the unknown like Peter. He's content to be in awe with Jesus without having to become the awe. Doesn't mean he isn't scared. Shoot, he looks like he's seen a ghost. And maybe he has. Who knows what fearsome circumstances 
Jesus revealed himself to Rembrandt through in 1633. Who knows what fearsome troubles Christ will appear through to you in the year 2023? I have no idea what your cancer, your car, or your career is going to do. I have no idea. But that look on Rembrandt's face, it's a trembling invitation to join him in the boat Christ put you in, to join him in his suffering and in his awe. A call to know the most terrifying being in all the cosmos. Just ask the demons, according to James, and to know him as the friend of sinners. It's a call to hang on. So hang on. The call to keep your eyes fixed to the east for the last watch. Because the one who's coming for you will only allow your plight and your curse to persist for so long. And he'll immediately reassure you with the same intensity as when he immediately puts you in that boat. It doesn't even matter if Christ takes you home because wherever Christ is, that is home. So try not to panic. If you see movement on the waves or a figure in the darkness walking where it shouldn't be, because therein lies your triumph, your rescue, and your redemption. It's your very own ghost on the water. Pray with me. Jesus, we come to you knowing all of our insufficiencies and insecurities. Knowing you intend for us to repent of overcompensating. So Jesus, cause us, cause us to have a wisdom beyond our years and a settled place in your sovereign care for us that maybe to until like this day was kind of foreign to our experience. Like we're asking you to carve out a new gear for what normal looks like for us. A trust in the midst of a flawed obedience, eager to take every, every, every single crisis we have and say, I cannot wait to see how the Lord will be vindicated this time, sometime. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Thanks so much. If you have questions about this episode, you can send them to info at rkchurch.com. Visit rkchurch.com for more information and don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so that you're notified when new episodes are made available.